On this podcast, you'll find interviews with high-performing, successful individuals in life sciences. On a weekly basis, we cover their proven methods, principles, strategies, and mindsets to implement new technologies that scale to meet the needs of people in our world. Welcome to Life Science Success Podcast. My name is Don, and today we're going to be talking about precision medicine and especially talking about using explainable AI with precision medicine. If For those of you who don't know me, I'm a consultant in life sciences. I help companies scale and manage complexity and increase performance. Today, I'm joined by Lance Taylor, Chakra Chenolta, and Dusty Majumdar. Welcome, guys. Hello. Great to be here. All right. So if we could just start with you, Lance, just really quickly, could you do an introduction to yourself for the audience? Uh, sure. Uh, pleasure to take part uh, in the podcast. I'm Lance Taylor. I'm the executive chairman of Spintelex, and I'm also the director of uh, drug discovery at the University of Pittsburgh Drug Discovery Institute. Very good. Welcome. Chakra, could you do a brief introduction to yourself? Uh, thanks, Don. Thanks for the invite. Uh, my name is uh, Chakra Chanabotla, and I'm the CEO of uh, Spintelex. All right. And Dusty. Hey, Don. Good to be back again on your uh, podcast. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, well, you know, I've been in the area of precision medicine now for over 20 years, uh, been in companies like GE, Exact Sciences, IBM. My journey with uh, AI, as you know, started when I was with IBM, and uh, I've been fortunate to see this whole cycle over the last decade, if you will, and currently working uh, with Spentelex, uh, heading up the strategy and marketing with Chakra and Lance, and uh, really enjoying positioning AI and precision pathology. All right, very good. Yeah, I almost feel like I should give you a frequent visitor card. I think this is podcast number four for you. You did one by yourself and a, co and a couple other ones and then the, a couple other panels and, and now this one. So thanks for coming back. And I mean, especially exciting you know, to get to talk to Chakra and Lance as well. Yeah, this is going to be exciting. All right. Michael. So um, so maybe we just start with kind of a, you know, a brief overview of this area. So what trends do you see in terms of precision medicine and AI? And, and Dusty, why don't I toss it to you first? Okay, sure. Uh, I'm sure that Lance and Chakra will have a lot to say about that too, specifically around uh, pathology. So I'll start at a little bit of a higher level. As you know, in between 2014 and 2018, uh, there was a lot of hope. There's a lot of hype as well. And what we see now are real applications with AI emerging. And, you know, the reason for that is we are now living in an era of tremendous convergence, if you will. We have more data than ever coming at us. Um, we have more computing power than ever before. And we have uh, AI, machine learning, deep learning algorithms, which are getting more and more robust. So things are changing over the last three or four years. This is the time when AI is becoming real. And specifically in oncology, um, as you know, there's so many variables that enter into a clinician's decision for a diagnosis and treatment. And AI can play a huge role in oncology. And we'll talk more about that. For example, in analyzing complex and heterogeneous data coming from multi-omics or interomics, if you will, uh, data integration to, make, to see a holistic view of the disease uh, monitor patients' tr uh, response, for example, you know, in a complex uh, disease like cancer, you got to check many different parameters to monitor that. And uh, there is a consensus that for precision medicine to succeed, you know, you have to look beyond just genomics at this point of time and take into account the different omics, uh, including the uh, pathological observations that uh, you know we'll talk about quite a bit today. Uh, in the case of solid uh, tumor cancers, and Don, you know this. A major issue is that patients don't respond very predictably to treatment. And uh, I think one of the estimates I've seen lately at Spentelex is that 90% of the drugs are effective for fewer than 50% of the patients. So think about that. Wow. Right. And, uh, and, and immunotherapy, many think, is, a, is, is, uh, is the ultimate miracle. And that's less than 20% effective in most cases. 
So a fundamental driver of the lack of effectiveness of immunotherapy is the heterogeneity in cellular composition and signaling network among cells. And we're going to talk about how Spentelix uh, addresses that. And the uh, intertumor and the intratumor heterogeneity plays a huge role in uh, drugs not being efficacious in many different kinds of uh, cancer. So that's what I see right now. And honestly, I mean, it's been a great journey uh, with AI starting, you know, with uh, the initial forays into healthcare uh, with uh, Watson Health and then working with uh, a range of startups and now, you know, really kind of enjoying working with uh, Spentelex and getting precision pathology to the next level. Yeah, it is for sure a, a very exciting time from both, a, 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 you know, where we stand with the science as well as where we stand with the technology. It's just a sort of a great pivotal point. Um, Chakra, uh, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, what trends are you seeing in terms of precision medicine and AI as a leader, as a leader of Spentelex? Uh, thanks, Don. So one of the things um, that uh, uh, Dusty alluded to is uh, who do we really, what are the solutions supposed to address? And then if you think about uh, both the clinicians and the oncologists and the pathologists who eventually use this, uh, there's a big gap in the trust of uh, AI algorithms and how much they trust it. And we saw a huge gap in the explainability of these algorithms. Um, the clinicians don't like to use black box algorithms where it spits out a decision without actually taking you through the thought process for how it made a decision. And it might show uh, heat maps, and that's a very popular approach. But heat maps have a trouble that you uh, project your opinion on these heat maps as opposed to actually revealing the underlying biology. And so when we looked at uh, the evolution of uh, technology, we found these to be big gaps uh, of not having the explainability and how you build the trust and how do you exploit the tumor micro environment in a more holistic sense uh, to build the technologies. And that's where uh, that brought us to uh, Spintelex. Lance? I mean, it's really exciting. You're truly exciting. And, and um, you know, great to know that, right? I mean, from a scientific standpoint, and this is where I would definitely go to you, Lance, is in terms of the sort of understanding how AI is making the decision, you know, I would imagine that that is pretty important overall and having the ability to really understand explainable AI versus, you know, a black box as well. But I would ask the same question, you know, what are you seeing in terms of precision medicine in your space and uh, especially with AI? So <clears throat> building on the idea of explainable AI, um, in our discussions with uh, potential customers, going back to the beginning of the formation of Spintelex, uh, we were told over and over again that explainable AI would be a game changer in the field uh, for the reason Chakra mentioned. People don't like to take direct decisions from an algorithm without understanding why the algorithm made the decision it, it did. So uh, we think the future clearly is with explainable AI so that the, the machine learning can occur, uh, but then the output to the end user, which would be the oncologist or pathologist or other clinician, they will be able to look at what the algorithms uh, decided and agree with it or not, and they're still in control, and that's critical in this field. Yeah, very important. And and so, I mean, with the hype, you know, kind of dying off uh, around, you know, what I would say AI, you know, could be, and it actually becoming a more of a reality, um, you know, what are you seeing some of the, the real applications now po powered by AI that are on the horizon? And Chakra, I'll come back to you um, maybe for the first answer on this one. So um, what we uh, observed, um, particularly, I'll take the pathology uh, field as the as a topic of interest here. Uh, 2017 was when um, FDA uh, cleared, uh, gave an approval for scanning a digital scanner where you can use uh, scan the slides, glass slides, and make a primary diagnosis. And this was the same time wherein uh, machine learning, particularly in the form of deep learning. Um, started uh, picking up steam, uh, and uh, in the first generation of tools that came, 
out uh, from these uh, efforts was to think of uh, these uh, digitized images as data uh, and then run, and then these are uh, vast, I mean, huge amounts of data that you get out of this uh, uh, scanning. Uh, run the deep learning algorithms uh, directly on these images. And then what we saw was exactly uh, something that we already spoke about is that there's a gap in explainability uh, that uh, even though these algorithms can run on these data sets, yeah, they don't uh, quite uh, meet up the expectations. Uh, so with that in mind, I think where the, uh, given the hype and given the reality of what uh, people want, um, there are many applications now wherein you can use AI if it is just the uh, basic uh, uh, counting of the cells. Uh, and that's happening in some domains, particularly in the pathology field, wherein all you need is a cell count, how many uh, CD3 positive cells are there, for example. Uh, but uh, that again falls very short of understanding uh, in great depth the disease biology. And then so it was clear for us that uh, if you want to get to the next stage, which is the precision pathology, uh, you need these additional tools. And I, my uh, take is that uh, something that uh, Dusty brought up, that this precision pathology will address many of these needs in um, uh, designing, you know, finding out why some patients respond to therapy and some don't. Um, what can, what, how you can build very powerful uh, companion diagnostic tests uh, and uh, and so on. So there will be a, a range of applications wherein you imagine a precision pathology making inroads. Very good. And uh, Lance, why don't we come to you next with regards to this? I mean, what are some of the real applications that you're seeing now um, that are powered by AI that are on the horizon? So uh, in, in the broadest sense, I think there is an understanding that uh, none of the individual omics are going to be uh, the only part of precision medicine. Uh, but there's power in genomics and metabolomics, proteomics, and uh, in pathology, in, uh, in precision pathology. And more and more uh, uh, data will be integrated uh, from a patient uh, using multiple omics. And it's going to be then critical to have explainable AI to again uh, tell the clinicians uh, the, the reasons for the algorithms making a particular recommendation. And that recommendation could be a particular therapeutic strategy. Uh, it could be identifying a potential novel uh, target for uh, drug discovery. Uh, it could be an, an important and powerful companion diagnostic to a drug that a pharmaceutical company is developing. And it can also be as, uh, as basic as uh, putting together uh, a full patient or what kind of comorbidities exist. So uh, it's going to play a central role. Absolutely. And, and Dusty, I, I would ask you the same, same question. Um, you know, what are the real applications that you're starting to see on the horizon uh, in this space as well? Yeah, so we're going to talk a lot about uh, precision pathology today. But, you know, if you, if you think about uh, the real applications that, you know, we are seeing today out there, the emergence of chatbots that uh, actually interact with patients uh, is on the rise. In robotic surgery, we see application of AI to reduce variation. It's, uh, there's a lot of data coming in, and uh, AI can definitely help in making sure that uh, it captures that you know, 3D, 4D data and helps to make the robotic surgeries more accurate and more precise. Uh, the emergence of virtual nursing assistants, uh, Lance talked about the use of precision medicine across the continuum of the drug discovery and development process. So from uh, identifying the right targets to the right biomarkers in discovery to identifying certain populations of response in the clinical trial phase, all the way to market access to really understand uh, the efficacy of uh, certain drugs in certain populations and opening up uh, patients with different clinical indications uh, I see application of AI throughout, you know, this whole spectrum. And the last thing I think that Lance was referring to was this whole concept of uh, digital twins, where now, you know, you can take all this data 
that you're collecting from various patient populations or maybe even individual patients and come up with uh, virtual patients on whom you can actually try different interventions. So uh, I will just uh, pass it on to uh, you, Don, and I'll mute my... Okay, very good. Um, so, I mean, as a, as a follow-up, I mean, one of, the, one of the things I know I saw years ago was this idea of having computer-aided diagnosis in, in radiology and, you know, just this, the, the whole idea around, you know, having something, you know, help to read, to read the images. Um, really, radiology and pathology were early adopters, you know, overall of, of AI. Um, you know, where are we going to now? Dusty? Well, I mean, radiology, I mean, if you uh, think about it, uh, went into, uh, into AI almost uh, 10 years ago in, in quite a big way. And they have made some progress uh, in terms of uh, um, helping the radiologist get augmented with AI. You know, one of the uh, quotes I heard some time back was, um, you know, radio uh, AI is not going to replace the radiologist. But the radiologists who uh, don't use AI would replace radiologists uh, or radiologists who use AI would replace radiologists who do. Um, so, Don, I mean, that's uh, that's that's going more and more clear with the passage of time that uh, AI is going to be a critical component of radiology. And, uh, you know, just like radiology and pathology, more and more digitization of images has happened over the last 20 years or so. And uh, it's no surprise that now pathology is emerging as uh, a key area in which AI is being deployed. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, to bring up some of the some of the chat that's going on currently while we're uh, while we're on here. Um, we have um, Michael's on. He's he's putting on your uh, your uh, website address so people can follow up with you there. Uh, it also looks like uh, Manisha is on from Boston uh, as well. So just uh, just wanted to to mention them uh, just briefly uh, as well before we get to the to the next question. So uh, welcome. And uh, so with that, um, you know, I guess you know Lance or Chakra, um, you know, I guess any any other thoughts in terms of where we're headed next in terms of. Um, uh, you know, early adoption of AI and radiology and pathology? Well, certainly, as you pointed out, uh, radiology has been using digitization uh, for the last decade. And so they got into the use of machine learning and AI uh, very early on. Uh, pathology had a, a lag. Uh, because it came to digitization kind of later, and it's only been in the last four uh, years or so where the FDA started approving particular scanners as uh, tools that were approved for doing diagnoses, not through the microscope, but from a screen. And that, of course, opened the door to the first generation of uh, so-called computational uh, pathology tools and uh, those tools have been very valuable. And I think this next generation, which will really use more sophisticated spatial analytics uh, to look at so-called spatial biology, and then tie that to explainable AI so that uh, the clinicians can understand what the algorithms are doing. And that gets to the point that these tools aren't designed to replace the pathologist or the oncologist, but to give them added support in terms of understanding, especially complex uh, patients, results from a complex patient. Uh, there's a lot of pathology that's very easy to spot, something that's obviously normal or obviously cancerous. It can be done uh, by any uh, algorithm. On the other hand, some uh, intermediate and difficult to identify things like in breast cancer with ADH, it takes the sophistication of the algorithms in order to pick it out. And one of the things that it we're seeing happen now is that it can be used as a pre uh, sign out tool for pathologists to make sure the subspecialists get those difficult cases because right now 90% of the effort of pathologists is spent on 10% of the samples. And that's because it's more or less a random handout of 
uh, the patient uh, samples to pathologists. This can help guide uh, the right patient to the right subspecialist. Yeah, I just, I mean, I, I look at the at this idea of sort of augmenting um, physicians who are intelligent uh, and already pl- applying complex, you know, thought, you know, to their field. And yet there's so much more information coming at everybody, you know, with regards to all the technology that we have available and having an assistant that can help us sort of sort through things would be important. Um, you know, I guess, Chakra, anything else that, that you would add to this point as well in terms of, you know, where we're headed? Yeah. So, Don, I feel like uh, both radiology and pathology being the, you know, key um, uh, dis- uh, points for the, you know, patient care. Uh, with radiology, you're mostly looking for patterns that are either there or not there. Yeah. But when it comes to pathology, uh, you have this extra, uh, there's so much information. First of all, the tissue is at the premium. Uh, and then there's so much more information and knowledge that you can extract, particularly indicating what might be the reason for the disease and where it might be heading next. And I think that sort of not just the diagnosis, but also the prognostic uh, aspect of the pathology makes it very interesting, makes it very challenging uh, for these algorithms. And I think uh, explainability, besides being very critical, will entirely change the workflow for the pathologist in ways Mm -hmm. that they'll appreciate more. It's um, already they have to go, when when you have the slides digitized, they have this workflow solution that they have to you know, log in. And then where, where the explainability comes in is that with the touch of a button, they can ask something, they can probe the disease, they can probe the tissue, and then ask what might be happening here. As Lance was alluding to, the places in that uh, tissue could be atypical ductal hyperplasia, particularly if it is a breast uh, biopsy, and there could be places where there is cancer. And it turns out a typical ductal hyperplasia happens about 15 to 20 percent of the population uh, for the breast uh, uh, biopsy or breast cancer patients. And the trouble here is that the discordance between pathologists in diagnosing a typical ductal hyperplasia for some of the studies that have been reported recently is extremely high, as high as 52 percent. So now the idea is that if it is ADH, you are uh, definitely want to get a second and a third opinion just to confirm that it is ADH. But if that is di- not diagnosed, the chance of that patient getting cancer is about 50% within 20 to 25 years. So knowing this very early on and knowing that this is actually a difficult case uh, is a, a key component of how these diagnostic tools uh, will play a role in assisting the pathologists and the clinicians uh, in, the, in, this, in the space of pathology. Very good. And then hey, Don, we see... one thing, one thing, one thing I want to hit upon before you go to the next question sure, is, sure. you know, what what Lance and Chakra both alluded to. So in radiology, one of the reasons why we don't see even now widespread adoption of AI after all these years, after hundreds of companies getting into radiology and coming up with these uh, AI algorithms, is to a great degree the lack of explainability. Now, there's a balance between explainability and accuracy, right? You can have a result that's 99% accurate, but you can't explain why because you have a black box. Now, is that completely useless? Probably not. You can still, view, but you need to have explainability, especially when you're trying to get to the root cause of a disease, a complex disease like cancer. And one of the critical obstacles in the widespread adoption of AI has been the perception of AI as a black box. And that's what these guys at Spintelex are trying to get away from. So, uh, you know, when uh, clinicians see the result, they're able to answer the question, why? Why are they seeing what they are seeing from an AI algorithm? And I think that's uh, that's critical. So uh, I would just say that, uh, you know, as we move along this discussion, you'll hear this theme over and over again, how explainability is making a difference. And I guess, I guess from that standpoint, I'm going to sort of take a, a bit of an aside as well. So um, why is it that explainability is important? I, um, you know, overall, I could kind of envision a few reasons, but, uh, you know, would, would love for one of you to, to, you know, just maybe, you know, provide a little bit more thought in terms of, you know, what you're thinking in terms of why why is explainability is more is so so important especially to the physician that's looking to care for their patient 
you know, I'll, I know those uh, Chakra and Lanska that speak about uh, pathology. I'll just say from a related field and drug discovery, when you're trying to understand complex interactions between <laughs> genomic data, lab data, the clinical data of the patient, and, you know, you want to develop a virtual arm or an in silico arm of a clinical trial, you need to understand the underlying circuitry of the disease. So if you don't really know a whole lot about, you know, why the AI algorithm is saying, you know, that this is where, you know, you should be going and you don't understand the underlying mechanisms, you cannot treat that disease and you cannot develop the next generation drug without understanding the basic underlying circuitry of the complex disease. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of one of the rationale for really understanding going beyond just a couple of layers of the CNN network at the top of the bottom, but you gotta kind of get deeper into it. Chakra? Right. Yeah, um, so explainability, I think, is on its path towards causation. In the end, I think the need to understand why something happened is critical across these disciplines, across really for a pathologist, uh, as I said, the tissue holds so much information as to where the disease started, where it is now, and where it is going next. And uh, in, although they're only looking at one image or maybe uh, several cross sections of the of the uh, the biopsy, that is a central theme that they're driving hard at. So, and that's where they would appreciate this uh, additional assistance and that's coming through explainability from the ai algorithms and we have seen that we have, we have spoken to uh, with the market uh, uh, research that we did uh, it was overwhelming impression that uh, that sort of explanations when we showed them the demo of how explainability works uh, they would come back and say you know this is going to be a in our adoption uh, of these systems and the best part is that they could override that and say you're wrong to the machine and let the machine continue to learn for that particular practice what kind of decisions are being made and why. Mm -hmm. I think that sort of interaction between the uh, clinician, in this case the pathologist, and the uh, AI algorithms would be the key for how AI could be adopted in a in a in a practice. So important. And and Lance, uh, anything you'd like to add to this as well? Yeah, if we think about this, it's true for radiology as well as pathology, but uh, pathologists in particular train for many years to look for patterns within uh, tissue sections. Uh, their brains were the algorithms, and uh, they could do pretty well. One of the challenges with looking at glass slides through a microscope is that uh, if people got very tired and the uh, reproducibility was not all that great between pathologists, whether they were looking at the slide early in the morning or at the end of the day. And in fact, some critical studies have shown that it's significantly uh, not good in terms of having uh, a dozen different pathologists look at exactly the same samples and make uh, the same call. Uh, it can be as bad as 50%. Uh, so the ability to have an aid, if you will, and have that aid use the same language that you do. In other words, when their brains look at the slide and make a call based on their visual uh, 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 algorithms, uh, then uh, if the uh, 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 explainable AI machine does the same thing, tells them the answer and why, it's reproducing what the pathologist brain was doing. This becomes then believable and they can have confidence in it. Now it becomes a true aid to the process rather than just a simple, well, we can replace the pathologist with a machine. So important overall. And, and um, you know, just this idea of, I, I think turning, turning over some of these very sort of critical, you know, elements of healthcare as well, is is from a patient perspective i would say you know i would want my i would want to know that my physician really knows kind of the background of the decision that was made at the end of the day instead of fully believing at the end of the day whatever it was that was given to them i mean you, you know you've gone to school you've you've done a lot to uh to look at all of the information that's out there why not just double check it with a with a computer or with with ai so yeah i agree <clears throat> We see uh, quite a few companies out there really trying to 
implement AI and pathology. Is there anything really that's that's groundbreaking that's come out so far? And uh, why don't we go to you, Chakra, for the, for this one? So um, thanks, Don. Um, as I said, I think uh, given uh, the uh, the nature of how the technology has evolved, uh, starting from the FDA approval of the scanners and this immediate application of the deep learning algorithms, particularly, uh, or the black box and other black box algorithms as well on this data, it was clear that you need this ladder to climb to the next uh, version, uh, which is the precision pathology. And, and the components of that is one, of course, explainability, and we talked about that. And the second is this unbiased spatial analytics. Uh, and here, uh, what I meant to uh, say is that when you run the deep learning algorithm, you can see that uh, it misses out on some key aspects of the biology. For example, it will never be able to tell you that this is a fusion cell, uh, wherein the fusion cell has properties of both a tumor cell and a macrophage cell. Right? And then what we realized is that um, having this ability of, for AI to recognize uh, these additional uh, 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 communication patterns between cells, because this fusion cell is a consequence of one such communication. And then keeping track of how this communication changes over time tells you how the disease has progressed. So this is, and to enable that, uh, you have technologies which do the spatial imaging of the tissue with the, uh, um, several biomarkers now. Um, there are platforms that can go up until 100 biomarkers. Uh, so pretty soon, this protein expression, these are mostly protein, but you can also have nucleic acids here. You'll see that the, uh, the protein expression will start matching up with the transcriptomics in not too uh, uh, distance. And there are many studies that show you that just because you have the mRNA expression does not necessarily mean that the protein expression follows from the mRNA, mRNA expression. So eventually what the proteins do is going to be a very key component and measuring it has been hard before, but gotten uh, 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 somewhat easier and hence the technologies are rapidly progressing. So both in the AACR, we saw that with the American Association of Cancer Research Meeting. And in the last two years, you see about half a dozen platforms already in the market allowing you to visualize these facial properties. But then there are no analytics that go with it to actually fully exploit uh, the information that you're getting. And that's where we come. Very good. Uh, Lance, anything that you're seeing that's uh, groundbreaking that's come out so far? Well, I think uh, uh, it is uh, important that the first generation computational pathology tools have been adopted rather rapidly during especially the last two or three years. And now there's been a great demand and people are beginning to see the importance of analyzing the spatial relationships between cells in tissues. And in particular, in uh, solid tumors, the appearance of so-called microdomains or specialized regions that have different types of cells in close association. And uh, that now uh, enables us to investigate within those regions the complex biology that is driving uh, the, the cancer. And I think uh, now the, the challenge is how much of the pathology and biology can be extracted. And right now we would say with the first generation tools, a lot is left on the table, if you will. And so in a natural progression, the power of the first generation tools has yielded a, a great deal. Now I think there's pressure to extract even more knowledge from these samples. Yeah, and Lance, yeah. it looks like it looks like you have a co-host over there on on your side. Uh, look like well, your cat yes. was about ready to join us. I it, and I had to notice how deftly I moved her away. <laughs> <laughs> it won't be the first. It won't be the first time here that this that that's happened. And and I have Great Danes um, that I have to prevent from entering the room because they would completely take the shot. So very well. <laughs> And on, so uh, just, to, just to build on, you know, what Lance yeah. just said and what Chakra said, uh, this is really a quantum leap in terms of where the first generation tools of pathology were and where Chakra and Lance, you know, have been able to take uh, these tools with Spentelex the last few years. Because understanding the spatial network and the cell-cell interactions and 
discovering those unique spatial collection of cells and cell states that may share, you know, something in common, you know, the, the micro domains, if you will. I think that's huge. And uh, that is where explainable AI comes in, because now you're explaining why a particular recommendation was made instead of just saying that the black box spit it out. And we believe that clinicians, pathologists would really trust this algorithm a lot more than what the first generation tools put out there. Yeah, and it, and it sounds to me like, I mean, I, I guess correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds to me like um, like s- spatial understanding in this space is what has been missing or more or less where the gap has been. I guess, Lance, I'd come back to you. Um, you know, where has the gap been uh, in terms of this, the, the overall space here for in precision medicine and AI? Well, and, and specifically for a pathology, but it's true for any of the omics, cell-cell uh, communications and subdomains of different kinds of cell populations that are communicating are crucial in disease progression. Uh, we have some good tools for single-cell uh, genomic analyses, uh, and you can get a lot of deep information from individual cells. The challenge there is that you can go deep on an individual cells, but how many cells uh, are communicating and can you get all of those cells with that kind of depth? Uh, Using pathology, which is uh, a spatial uh, omics approach to begin with, because you can look at multiple cells in parallel, and if you have enough biomarkers, you can define these domains. And in fact, you can, in an unbiased way, have the data tell you what the micro domains are. Uh, In the first generation tools, it's more biased. You might identify a couple of key biomarkers and then extract information from around those biomarkers. But in this second generation approach, the data itself in an unbiased way tells uh, the, the user what are the domains that you should be looking for? And then it automatically identifies those domains and then can extract great depth of information from those micro domains. But once again, uh, there's going to be a a deeper integration of multiple omics. Uh, And I think it will be even more focused regionally. So I think the most spatial analysis will come from the spatial biology in new precision pathology, but also being able to direct the other omic uh, extraction of information based on this unbiased identification of key so-called microdomains, where you focus the metabolomics, proteomics, or genomic analyses. And AI would be critical in integrating all these different uh, complex data sets. You know, one thing to remember in terms of what Lance just said, Don, is that you got to go micro, you know, real small, and you got to kind of look at the organization of cells at the macro level as well. So you got to look at the forest and the trees. Yeah, you know, right. Not, right. So that's the key here. Chakra? So I was going to add uh, to that uh, sort of discussion is that, uh, uh, Don, biology is not static, um, and the tissue actually tells you a story. Uh, and the emergent behavior is the key here. And you need tools that actually capture that emergent behavior, like uh, Lance was pointing out. Some of these microdomains might be unique to this patient. And heterogeneity is not random. Heterogeneity is organized as the structural units that we are calling as microdomains. And they emerge and you don't know beforehand how to, you know, that what to look for. And you should let the data drive uh, for, for the emergence and for the capturing of these microdomains. And I think that's the key for how best to use these uh, technologies going forward. I mean, the best thing that I'm hearing too is that you're not only sort of looking at what's happening today, it's you're giving information for what might happen tomorrow, um, which, you know, really for from um, what, I've, what I've seen in my personal experience with uh, with cancer with family members is that you know so often you see this sort of this turn where they they're treated one way and all of a sudden you see that it looks like you know their treatment is progressing and so quickly it can turn around and you 
you know, all of a sudden can be back in a, in a worse spot than you were originally. And so, um, you know, from, from that, that point standpoint alone, I, you know, I definitely think that we need all the tools possible to kind of look at what might possibly happen in this, in this world of ours. And you need to capture that insight that could be hidden. It could be so subtle, right? So that's what, uh, that's what uh, spatial biology and really kind of AI can, can yield, and sometimes it's not obvious, but the solution may be right there. You're just not seeing it. You know, there's a famous quote by uh, Einstein that uh, God is subtle, but not malicious. So it's, uh, you know, the hint may be already there. <clears throat> right. So Lance, can you tell us a little bit about the, the evolution of pathology and why digit digitization is such a big deal? Yes, yeah, so um, pathology was essentially the last uh, uh, imaging medical platform to be digitized. And part of that was, again, what I mentioned before, that pathologists are well-trained and their brains are the computer and the AI. And they didn't uh, believe early on that a machine could do as well as they could. But it is a fact that uh, pathologists are human. They get tired. You look at n number of patient samples a day. Uh, you just can't be uh, perfect on every call, coupled with the fact that there are subtleties, uh, as Chakra said earlier, in some of these uh, biopsies that it would be very difficult to identify. So I think two things happened. One, a new generation of pathologists uh, came along that were used to doing video games. And so <laughs> dealing with a computer monitor was, uh, was uh, simple to them. Uh, and the other thing was the fact that in some well-published uh, uh, studies, it was shown that the concordance between pathologists looking at the same samples wasn't nearly as high as you'd expect it to be. And that has nothing to do with the quality of the pathology but the complexity of the heterogeneity in these samples. And so uh, the, the new generation of pathologists said, well, uh, we should start looking at making these measurements. The first thing that had to happen for them to be involved was the FDA had to approve of the first platform uh, to, uh, for uh, doing diagnoses. And that's been done and multiple platforms are now uh, improved. And then it became feasible, once you had a digital image of the path sample, to start doing quantitation. And it started out doing very simple thing, counting the number of cells in cell division, uh, counting the number of T cells within a region relative to tumor cells. These are pretty straightforward measurements, and they're also kind of tedious for the pathologists to do themselves, which they had done uh, in the past. Uh, once that was shown to be uh, useful, uh, this first generation, the so-called computational pathology we've been talking about, then started demonstrating capability. And in fact, uh, the, the FDA has approved the first couple of tests based on uh, computational pathology. And so that's made a major move forward. And then I would say this next generation that we've introduced of, so we're calling it precision pathology because we've taken it a step further in making it unbiased and explainable. Yeah, I think I said this to Dusty previously that the um, I, I, I was speaking to somebody that just came out of school on the radiology side uh, and she was essentially telling me, look, you can't take away, um, you know, what we have in terms of digitization and in, in AI and radiology. It's uh, it's something that we feel like we need to have now. And um, because, the, I mean, there's this, just this general discussion, which I think you guys hit on earlier, which is, you know, hey, is AI going to come and take our jobs away? Um, but as we're as we're seeing, data just continues to grow at an exponential rate, and you just have to have you know people that that are helping to interpret the results. And Don, I was going to add that uh, COVID, uh, the pandemic, um, has changed some other practices. So um, there's a relaxation from FDA as to how and when you can diagnose. So uh, you can test it uh, you can on your laptop. 
uh, without having necessarily an approval from FDA. So that also um, increased the acceptance of uh, checking out and you know being able to view these images on digital platforms and be able to uh, make diagnosis. So that had an uh, impact in the last two years. So important. Um, so Dusty, I'll come to you. So in terms of uh, in radiology, the fact that images were already digitized, digitized and uh, accelerated the adoption of AI, um, did a similar thing happen in pathology? Uh, struggling oh, yeah. to get the words as, out, but I, yeah. As, as Lance, you know, just said, right, uh, uh, pathology kind of followed radiology uh, in terms of uh, digitization. They were a little bit behind, but then I think it was uh, three or four years ago when FDA actually said that you could, you know, read from digitized images. That's when it really took off, and that's where you see the emergence of a lot of these AI-powered uh, pathology companies, uh, which are currently, as uh, Lance said, mostly first generational in terms of capability. Uh, most of them don't really look at uh, this from an explainable AI perspective. And the spatial element uh, seems to be uh, missing in a lot of cases. And that's where, you know, Spentelex has come in and really uh, taken this to the next level with the explainable AI and understanding deeply spatial biology or spatial analytics. Lance, uh, you have anything to add since you have seen the field for a long time? Yeah, no, I think I, uh, it, rather than adding to that, because I think you summarized it well, I just want to pick up on something you mentioned earlier, Dusty. Where is all of this going? I hope I didn't take one of your questions away from you, Don. <laughs> no. uh, and that, what is the potential outcome from where we are uh, in using machine learning and uh, uh, artificial intelligence. I think the future of precision medicine, and I, this is just a personal view, other people share it, but is that the so-called patient digital twins are going to be emerging. Of course, digital twins as a technology have been around for a long time in, in various industries, but now there's a a growing amount of clinical data on every patient uh, that is, can be managed over time for that patient. And now we also are in the realm where using uh, uh, I, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells and organoids, you can actually create uh, what I like to call biomimetic twins of the patient by uh, making uh, the a patient on a chip. And that technology has begun to explode. And now we have the potential to have the actual patient of data, and you can't do experiments on patients, but you now have the biomimetic twin that you can do experiments on, test drugs on and do other manipulation. Wrapping all around that is uh, machine learning uh, tools uh, to integrate all of this data and explainable AI to bring that patient to uh, kind of a, a, a point. Now, this is a huge, this is a moonshot. I would say maybe it's a Venus shot, but it's something that we have the beginnings of the tools to approach. And I think more and more places will begin putting this together. And because of the spatial element of doing pathology, uh, precision pathology will be a central component of this direction. Yeah, I've had Trivia Frazier on the podcast before. She's the CEO of Obatala Sciences. They have uh, organ organoid on a on a chip, you know, sort of technology. And um, for sure, I could see the, the the future of you know what this might be able to contribute in general to the field, especially if you could have digital twins of you know patients that that are you know maybe you have multiple routes of care um, that that you could possibly go down. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to be able to to test some of them in the future? Yeah, that's actually coming to life as we speak. Very, very exciting. Yeah. Chakra, anything else that you would add? I was going to say that uh, clearly uh, there is this multi-dimensionality of this uh, data uh, coming from many different places, and it would be nearly impossible. Uh, without a computational aid to process all this information and get a holistic uh, sort of uh, understanding of this data set. So that's another place wherein 
uh, I don't think so you can live without those computational aids. And then the question is that, uh, how good are these aids and what exactly are they adding uh, to your decision making? Are they helping you get to the next place or are they stopping you or slowing you down? Uh, and I think the explainability there again uh, makes sense across uh, these, uh, you know, all these domains that we mentioned. Yeah, and it seems like, um, I mean, in terms of literature, spatial biology is pretty, uh, you know, something that, that a lot of people are, are taking a look at as well. Um, you know, I guess, you know, why why is why now, I guess, is the, the key question that I would have. Chuck, yeah, Chuck, that, or, uh, uh, Lance, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it is... Um, surprising how something once it people start doing it how obvious it is but what the uh the mountain that has to be climbed to get people thinking like that so in pathology pathologists knew they had to scan a slide and look for patterns so it's been clear for a long time that the spatial relationships in standard transmitted light uh h and e staining it is important. What's happened and maybe what's really triggered this is the development of these multiplexed and hyperplexed labeling schemes. And mm. as Chakra mentioned, there are now four or five very good platform companies that can produce uh, multi uh, or hyperplexed labeled samples from just three or four biomarkers all the way up to 100 biomarkers. So you can really define in molecular terms uh, the p patient uh, sample on a slide. So then the challenge is, okay, how do you capture all of that information in an unbiased way to find the spatial relationships and how do you explain what's actually there and how does it relate to uh, the disease? So probably the development of the imaging platforms with the different reagents was the real trigger that opened the door. Very good. Chakra, did you have anything to add? I, th I thought I saw, saw you start to answer as well. Uh, uh, no, I think I was going to second that. And uh, uh, again, go back to the idea that how the, in the case of tumor, in the case of cancer, uh, what is the host response? And the host response uh, in the communication, which involves communication between cells, and this communication is spatial. So there's no going around it. Uh, and the idea is, how well can you capture this communication and how do you, uh, the emerging patterns of this communication and, uh, and hence this uh, additional interest in spatial biology now and knowing how uh, something that Dusty mentioned before, the heterogeneity is killing uh, and, and the fact that the, uh, you know, the drugs don't work uniformly well. Uh, so knowing the micro environment and understanding the micro domains has become uh, the critical uh, aspect from immunotherapy to you know, all the standard uh, therapies out there. Uh, and hence, this addition, I feel that uh, there's an additional focus now on spatial biology to really understand uh, the micro and one. Maybe, Chakra, we can get a little bit more granular here. So talk about immunotherapy and the failures in immunotherapy right now and why you think understanding the spatial environment, understanding a little bit more from an explainable standpoint, you know, the functionality of cells, if you will, how their development, how is that going to help in uh, today, uh, the response rate for patients uh, with cancer, uh, stage four cancer to immunotherapy is less than 20%. How is that going to help in improving that? Yeah, I was um, thinking of an example. Uh, we talked about microdomains. Uh, so tissue lymphoid structures, TLS, um, this is something that people have noticed. Um, the renal cell carcinoma and other places, uh, wherein uh, they actually count the number of tissue lymphoid structure and they found a, a prognostic value for how many of these uh, tissue lymphoid structures are there. And what they are, are a collection of the T cells and the B cells, uh, but nobody knows um, what the role uh, really of these uh, cells are. When, when are they suppressive? Uh, when do they promote cancer? Uh, and so this really requires you to understand the spatial nature of the interactions between these cells and with the cancer cells right outside or right surrounding them. Uh, and, and understanding that network biology definitely means that you have found a way to explain the behavior uh, of these uh, 
micro domains in the form of tissue lymphoid structures, let's say, uh, in, in uh, predicting the response of this patient to a particular therapy. And this, I think, has become the key across all uh, therapeutic modes. Yeah, and I mean, so one follow-up that I would also have is, uh, what feedback do you have from customers, Chakra? Yeah, so um, we, uh, the two things that we noticed with the first generation platforms, one is that if you look at this continuum of imaging, you have the transmitted light uh, platforms that generate transmitted light images, the HND and the IHC. Uh, and then you have these other platforms which generate the multiplex and hyperplexed um, uh, data sets. And it was clear that we need uh, solutions that can cover this uh, continuum of uh, data sets. So we have two offerings, uh, Histomapper and uh, Tumor Map. Histomapper is for the transmitted light data sets and tumor mapper is for the multiplex and hyperplex data sets. And what the customers have wanted up until now, and I think that will be the trend, is that they want to be able to use both the platforms uh, in, uh, in, in understanding the tissue, because each one of these platforms is giving you uh, different information, morphological ideas with the transmitted light and the biomarker expression, what is the spatial statistical relationship between the biomarkers. And on the transmitted light side, it would be what are the histological structures and what sort of modeling can you do of these histological structures and the progression with respect to the progression of the disease. So the customer feedback really is that use of both these platforms in analyzing and uh, extracting knowledge of the data set. Maybe Lance, you can talk a little bit about the colorectal cancer results that you have, uh, where you actually had a direct comparison between what uh, you guys do and uh, the results from genomics. So sure, <clears throat> one of the projects that we did was on colorectal cancer. And one of the challenges was in being able to make uh, decisions on recurrence. Uh, and uh, using the primary tumor, we were able to look at in retrospective study, which is the first one that was done, we could identify uh, those characteristics of these micro domains and the biomarkers and their interactions that were consistent with uh, of recurrence uh, within uh, eight years and those that were consistent with no recurrence over that period of time. Uh, and digging deeper within these micro domains using uh, what we call uh, uh, systems pathology we can define the network biology within these micro domains and actually identify key changes that occur that are consistent uh, with uh, recurrence or not. This then changes the approach that you would take in therapeutic strategy. And uh, actually one of our uh, collaborators wanted to be able to have a, a, a test to uh, choose what treatment would go to what patient based on what is predicted. Because up until that time, it was basically hit or miss. And you know that from, it sounds like your own experience in your family with cancer, a lot of time, the patients are uh, the experimental objects uh, because they don't know what the optimal treatment would be. If treatment A doesn't work, uh, then you go to treatment B. So a great opportunity here is to be able to make predictions about what's going to happen that can then guide uh, the therapeutic strategy for those individual patients. And in fact, in terms of the, uh, the, how well uh, uh, the uh, precision pathology worked compared to genomics test, uh, the uh, presently reimbursed genomics test had a so-called area under the curve, uh, which uh, is kind of one of the metrics used of about 0.72, which is good enough that it was approved and reimbursed. People use the test, but using uh, the Spintelex approach of unbiased spatial analytics and explainable AI, <clears throat> we could push it over 0.9. Uh, and so, uh, I think the, the impact is significant, and that even brings bigger focus to the fact that spatial relationships are important. And just sampling the different regions of genomics, but at what I would call low spatial resolution, is not powerful enough, which is why people started to move to single-cell genomics 
but you'd want to do that relative to a high resolution spatial uh, uh, biology approach. And that's what uh, we bring to the table. I think the, the follow on question that I would have for you, though, too, Lance, is where do you see this going next? I mean, where, what then happens and how does this evolve uh, going further? Well, I think this is going to be one of the important tools <clears throat> in precision medicine where a, a patient uh, is going to be analyzed and uh, treatments uh, designed in advance based on their data. And uh, I think uh, in, in is cancer as an example, we'll stop doing the experimental testing uh, and try to identify those patients based on their genetic makeup and environmental characteristics have a higher probability of responding to drug A uh, than another uh, subpopulation. So it's going to improve patient uh, outcomes as well as uh, quality of life in, in, in cancer going through whatever treatment uh, there are. The other thing is kind of using the same technology, one can select optimal cohorts for clinical trials. So we know that a lot of these uh, drugs that don't get approved did have an effect on you know, 20, 30, 40% of the population of patients, but they were random population. If you could identify cohorts of patients that have characteristics that increase the probability that the drug will uh, have an effect and the patient will respond, you'll collect those patients and make a, a clinical trial cohort. Now we can have uh, drugs that are really targeted to the right subpopulation of patients. And as Chakra already said, going along with that, the same technology can be used to develop a companion diagnostic, which especially in cancer, this is something the FDA is very interested in, but it's all from that unbiased spatial analytics and the explainable AI. So I wanna start wrapping us up, but uh, in terms of, um, you know, just, you know, other follow-ons, Chakra or Dusty, do you have anything to add to that? I do have one last question that I wanna to come to, but, uh, you know, anything else to add on this one? Well, I think in general, uh, what, I would, what I would say is that, Don, we have talked about this. Uh, this is the century of biology, right? When Sam Hanash and I were at the last uh, podcast, we talked about uh, the fact how the march of discovery is continuing through the century, right? And, uh, you know, if you, if you recall 2003, when the Human Genome Atlas was published, the headlines in New York Times and Time Magazine was that we have unraveled the mysteries of life, you know, the picture of Francis Collins and Greg Venter, yeah, right. right? So, and we know now that, you know, we barely scratched the surface with genomics, right? Um, so now, as Who we are progressing- Who would have thought that humans are more complex, Dusty? <laughs> humans are way more, and cancer is a very complex disease, right? So right. as we are looking into genomics from a point of view of mutation, methylation, uh, RNA expression, proteomics, uh, looking at metabolomics, looking at the microbiome environment around the- tumor micro uh, around the tumor the micro environment of the tumor and looking at pathology in terms of development of the functionality of cells in the tumor micro environment combining that with robust explainable ai and powered by next generation computational technology whether it's quantum computers you might need you know very powerful computers to do all the computation ultimately when you have all this information together that is going to result in the outcomes that uh, Lance is talking about. And then, of course, you know, once you develop the digital twin based on all this information, you can actually have interventions on the digital twin to see, you know, the efficacy of the safety of drugs. So that's the promised land that we are you know, working towards. Hopefully in the next 10 years, we'll get closer to that. Yeah, it's, uh, it, well, I mean, I was talking to somebody earlier today about uh, Amazon's compute because they uh, they constantly, whenever, you know, whenever you need more compute power, you just turn to Amazon and just say, hey, I need more compute, and they turn it on. Um, so this idea of having supercomputers and, and other things, you know, becomes much more of a reality for people that are developing fabulous technologies. And so, I, Chakra, I would come back to you maybe for my last question here. Um, 
you know, as the CEO of Spintelex, how do you see this evolves with regards to the to the patient and you know how things get used into the future? Um, where do you see this the clinical workflow go um, for patient outcomes? Yeah, happy to respond to that, uh, Don. So, sustainability we focus a lot on that and how it's going to change the workflow. Um, one way to put all this in context is if you have a cohort whose clinical profile is all roughly the same, their molecular phenotypes are roughly the same, some responded to therapy and some did not, uh, there's, there's nothing you can do. And that's when I think by looking at the tissue, by doing this unbiased spatial analytics and explainable AI, we have this power to, uh, to uh, dig deeper into why some responded to therapy and some did not. And I think this basic idea will pervade all the application scenarios that we painted, whether it is companion diagnostics or whether it is drug discovery or suggesting novel combination of drugs. This idea that you look at space and you have to look at the space with the idea that biology is going to emerge and you want to capture this emergent biology in an unbiased manner. And I think that's where this is going to head up. And, and on just in breast cancer, there are 700,000 biopsies done every year in the US. And if you look at all cancers, probably a few million. And I would say that at this point, we use less than 1% of the information that uh, is extracted from them in standard pathology and also by the Gen 1 path AI and path AI pathology tools that we have. So we got to go beyond that. And so that's where that's definitely where this could contribute. Lance, uh, how about from you? So this is even going to permeate uh, the practice of pathology, whether it's in medical centers or in private practices. Uh, we have a collaboration with a large West Coast pathology practice with greater than uh, 60 pathologists. And one of the challenges is how do they get, and they have a specialist, subspecialist, as well as generalists. How do they get the right patient sample to the right pathologist? And with a workflow in place where the images are managed, the metadata is managed, the digital images are managed, and with the application of the uh, precision pathology, uh, initial decisions are made and they can be directed to the right pathologist who can then look at the data, ask the question why, make sure they agree uh, with what the algorithm is said or not, uh, the efficiency is going to go up dramatically. Now, the pathologists aren't going to be replaced by these tools, but their talents are going to be focused on the more difficult, challenging uh, samples. And so the efficiency and accuracy will go up. We've already done some studies uh, on some early work that showed both of those occurred. And uh, the patients will be happier because they'll get a faster, more accurate diagnosis. Yeah, so th thank you so much. Any final comments from anybody before I wrap us up? Well, this was a great conversation. I'm glad that I uh, you know, got to be in this with uh, the folks from Spentlex and uh, you know, really appreciate Don giving us this opportunity. Thanks so much. And so, uh, Lance, Chakra, and Dusty, thank you so much for being a part of the Life Science Success Podcast. I greatly appreciate you being here. Don, uh, we enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to Life Science Success. For complete details about this podcast, including show notes, how to get in touch with guests, and more episodes, please visit www.lifesciencesuccess.com. If there's someone you'd like for us to invite to the show as a guest, please let me know by sending me a message at the podcast website. Please click subscribe on your favorite podcast app, share the podcast or tell a friend about it, and last but not least, rate the podcast. Thank you again. Mm -hmm.